Good morning, welcome back. I'm going to review with you the calendar and talk about what's going to happen this week. Then I will offer the main ideas and concepts from two of the chapters from the last textbook, Wikipedia at 20. Those two chapters will also be the last two to be included in the list a short list of readings for the final exam that I'm going to examine today after the presentation of the notes on those two chapters. So today, as usual, after the class, I'll be in my office from noon to 1 p.m. in the Melville Library. However, on Wednesday, the office hour will be slightly delayed and will be on Zoom. You can also reach out to me for questions or assistance with your final project on Tuesday between 4.30 and 6 p.m. And I invite you to schedule an appointment even half an hour before that time so that you will not have to wait because, of course, the Zoom room is set up with a waiting room. If I am with a student, you would be left out waiting. If you schedule your time slot, then uh, you don't waste too much of your time. Same on Thursday for the regular office hours. On Wednesday, during my class, I'm going to complete the presentation of the material from the textbook entitled Wikipedia at 20. And of course, if there are questions about the exam or about your project, I'll be offering my assistance. Wednesday will be the last class when I will be taking attendance. If all goes well, by Friday, I'm, I'm done with the uh, program. Uh, with, with my lectures, with my presentations, I'll be here mostly for anyone who would like to come and talk about the exam or the project. So attendance on Friday is optional, not mandatory. People have already scheduled some presentations on Zoom using Calendly at calendly.com slash Andrea Fedi. More people have scheduled their Zoom presentation for next week. Keep in mind, it's your choice. I recommend that you present live in front of me because uh, the, the effect is usually greater and some of the recorded presentation can be a bit low key exactly because you're very comfortable. However, as I said, it's your choice. Just keep in mind that you have to either present in front of me on Zoom or share a presentation by the end of next week. Let's review what's going to happen after the first week. The digital project is due on Monday. If you need an extension because you have other final assignments, I can give you a short extension. Do it properly, do it before the deadline. Request your extension before the deadline. I recommend that you observe this so that the completion of your project doesn't encroach with finals, etc. Friday, as I said, is the last day to present or to share a video with me. And the final exam will take place in this room on May the 16th, Monday, at the unfortunate hour of 8.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. It's not a big difference for me because I teach here at 9.15 and I try to get here early to beat the traffic because I don't want to be late. So usually by 8.45, 9 o'clock, I'm here. So I just have to leave the house a little bit earlier. Make sure that you're here on time. By 10.45, we have to vacate the room that day. So if you're late, I can give you extra minutes. No problem there if you are five minutes late, but if you're an hour late, you cannot have that hour back. OK, 
okay? So make sure you don't forget. I will send you a reminder the day before. I will send everyone a reminder of the final exam. Okay, so that was it. Again, this is the link. And from this link, you can then select oral presentations, look at the days that are available. And whenever you select one of those days, you can see all the time slots that are available. <coughs> that are still available, of course, if any is taken by anyone, or if I have to schedule a meeting to be somewhere at the university, then some of the time slots will disappear. From there, you go to a form, provide your first and last name, your email, use your Stony Brook email address, and uh, you, you proceed from there. You receive a message back from the system. Keep that message because if you want to reschedule, cancel and reschedule, you'll find there a link that allows you to do so and feel free to reschedule as needed. No problem with me. Everything is automatic. When you schedule a meeting, it goes on my agenda. It appears on my agenda, which I review uh, daily. And uh, if, you, if you reschedule, it's, it's simply canceled and added to another time slot. This is today, today's lesson plan. I will first review the notes about two additional chapters that I added last night. And then, together with you, I'll review this sub-page called Readings and Topics to Review for the final exam, go over the shortlist, answer any questions, etc. So the chapters I added and the last to be included in the shortlist as you will see, uh, are 10 and 12. Chapter 10 is a brilliant chapter. All of these chapters are quite easy to read and not very complex, both intellectually and in terms of the language used. I share the main idea, the position of the author of this particular chapter, and I've expressed that uh, in other discussions, in other presentations, the idea that part of, of the success of Wikipedia is founded on this kind of culture that you find reflected in the practices and the discussions of the Wikipedians. And this in some ways explains also <coughs> why <coughs> the Wikipedia community is not so diverse in terms of gender and ethnic group because Wikipedians act as if they were involved in an online game. They've brought into Wikipedia the attitudes of gamers, whereby by providing revisions, contributions, changes, corrections, or new entries to Wikipedia, they see themselves elevated in rank within the community the same way that it would happen for Call of Duty or Forza Motorsport, anything where you have online gamers competing against each other. Only in this case, the rules of the games are kind of complex because you have a lot of policy documents to be familiar with. You have practices that you have to make your own um, and therefore, the grinding is, is noticeable right before you get to a position of power within the community, but that is essential, the social, digital kind of game that uh, Wikipedians, that a lot of Wikipedians are involved with. The author of this chapter is Polish, a Polish academic, and he says that years ago, that's the premise, he was running an online dictionary, a free online dictionary of Polish that was also covered by Wikipedia. So the dictionary, like other similar, similar uh, 
dictionaries, other online dictionaries, had its own entry in the Polish Wikipedia. And the author confesses to having edited that page himself to embellish, to make his website, his dictionary, better known, more popular. At some point, there comes a time when, uh, which, as, as it was common during the last part of the 2000s for Wikipedia, when this page and all the pages that were similar to it, other pages covered in dictionaries, was slated for deletion, right? Remember the discussion, the controversy, the debate among, between deletionists and inclusionists, among Wikipedians who want to have only the most notable content included and others that are more liberal in terms of inclusion. So the author tried to fight off. He didn't want his page on Wikipedia, which was a point of pride to be covered by Wikipedia, to be deleted. The first obstacle the author found is that if you don't have a history of edits, then your position doesn't carry much influence within the community. Without that history, you're nothing. When you try to vote, when you try to decide, you can even be barred from any kind of vote on issues such as inclusion or deletion. The page stays on, the page is deleted. So the author starts adding edits to his own page, of course, in order to gain the numbers and increase his rank. And he gets the sufficient number of edits that would allow him to vote and to have more influence over decisions about that page. But then, of course, the other members of the Wikipedia community, the other contributors, are quick to note that in any discussion that there is a COI, a conflict of interest, right? You're trying to bear on the decision whether to delete or not your own page. Well, not your own page, a page you contributed to and a page that covers something that you've done yourself. So this is when this realization comes that this kind of discourse, this, kind, this set of practices is very similar to games. Having gained familiarity with the process, the author of the chapter continued to do changes even after his page, as well as similar pages covering other dictionaries, were deleted from Wikipedia. And eventually he grew in rank in the community up to the highest level, right? Becoming a trustee of the Wikimedia Foundation. Therefore, someone who has oversight over matters of arbitration, policy, etc. Being someone from academia, the author added a nice section about Wikipedia and academia. It doesn't go into all the details that I provided before. He continues on from his own particular point of view. He acknowledges that there is a problem with the perception of Wikipedia. Wikipedia in academia enjoys has a very bad reputation. However, at the same time, there is a big contradiction because when you're inside academia, you know that everyone, students as well as faculty, use, will use Wikipedia at some point or another. If you have a computer, there are two things for sure that uh, you will do at some point or another. Google something, look for something inside Wikipedia. The author reminds us that we know from previous studies of samples, even large samples, as many as a thousand articles, have shown that Wikipedia's accuracy is on par, if not better, than other published encyclopedias, professional encyclopedias. And of course, there are biases within Wikipedia 
but you can find similar biases also in peer-reviewed publications or encyclopedias. In terms of design, Wikipedia is clearly the winner because it does impose standards of design and rules for the formatting of an article, of an entry, that are not always consistently applied in peer-reviewed academic publications. You need to have sources. You need to systematically include references to sources. And those sources will be verified, whereas peer-reviewed articles are not subject to a systematic verification by the readers, right? When a professor submits an article or a book for publication, usually two reviewers, sometimes three, will have to review and approve the material before publication. They will base their recommendation to publish or not to publish on their own expertise and sometimes on some random verifications they will do, but they won't be as systematic and widespread uh, verification as it happens for many entries in Wikipedia, right? Why? Because Wikipedians are competing against each other to increase their rank by finding things to correct, right? Which enhances their reputation, gives them numbers of edits, etc., etc. So the question, if so many students and even faculty, members of the faculty are using Wikipedia, why not, for example, turn the traditional paper done by all students in a variety of classes into contributions to Wikipedia? Those papers eventually are shredded, right? Put in a trash can and have to keep your papers for, what, two, three years, I usually keep them for longer, something like five years. Eventually they go into a blue bin if they're printed or they go into a digital trash can if they're digital, okay? So why not have something that will be read by not just the instructor but other readers, something that might increase shared knowledge on a platform that has free access, that offers free access. And some reasons are provided by, by the author, right? So he offers the criteria that apply to a normal article, to a normal encyclopedia article, and then he tries to explain why this doesn't happen, meaning an, an entry for an encyclopedia article is rigorous, even Wikipedia can be rigorous, why is not this a kind of common practice that academics in are involved with? Why aren't more academics participating in the process of expanding the knowledge stored on Wikipedia? First reason that is given, it is difficult. Well, it is difficult, of course, because there are so many policy documents, because there are so many standards and rules that you have to follow that academics are not familiar with because they're alternative to the standards that are imposed by academic publication. Second problem, again, a problem of perception. Yes, Wikipedia may be accurate for the most part, but when it is not accurate, when it is biased, it can be inaccurate and biased in a clamorous way, in a scandalous way. So the attention of the public is more attracted by the hoaxes, such as the George Mason University hoax or other hoaxes listed in Wikipedia's own list of wiki hoaxes. And so even though plenty of people rely, including uh, medical students of all people, right? Uh, imagine the powerful consequences of something inaccurate learned by a medical student from Wikipedia. In spite of the degree of reliance on Wikipedia, this public perception keeps scholars of academia away from <coughs> this because by nature 
they're not people who want to engage in any kind of controversy. Finally, if you look at the last few years, the author <coughs> remarks that you can see on YouTube, on Twitter, on other platforms, that there is an increase in the number of people who don't trust traditional science and the traditional scientific approach. Anything from uh, those who believe in a flat earth to the anti-vaxxer, etc., etc. And therefore, we know the public perception is that some of these groups are active within Wikipedia and that induces caution and makes people distance themselves from people from academia, distance themselves from Wikipedia. The final reason that is provided here for the lack of engagement by academic scholars in the Wikipedia enterprise is the governance, right? The governance is supposed to be a hierarchical, no official formal hierarchy, which is the opposite of what academia, academia is. Academia is highly hierarchical. And in terms of perception, again, it seems like some of the mechanisms to address disagreements can be messy or even bizarre. And on the other side, you have a group, professors, university professors, that rely on a tradition that at this point has about a thousand years since the creation of the first European universities. Some things have not really changed that much. The next section, however, is altogether an explanation of the larger philosophical reasons why scholars don't engage in Wikipedia. Because Wikipedia is like very similar to a colossal RPG role-playing game. And of course, this is a provocative statement. Wikipedia is a role-playing game. Role-playing game is a metaphor, is an intellectual model. However, when you apply it, you gain a lot of understanding. You find the explanation for a lot of internal phenomena, including some of the limitations, built-in intrinsic limitation of Wikipedia, especially in reference to the limited number of women uh, who engage in editing and the lack of diversity to a degree. <clears throat> It's a massive multiplayer online role-playing game because you find a lot of people collaborating, but they're actually playing the role of editors, meaning they don't have some intrinsic or extrinsic motivation to add information on Wikipedia. They do it for the ranking. It is secondary to their position in the community. They're deadly serious about staying in character. In fact, the discussions on Wikipedia can be very serious even on minor details. And in some ways, they can be more serious than discussions that take place on academic forums. The very fact that there are so many rules <coughs> about editing, so many policy documents, simply confirms that the rules are the instruments that make veteran players, veteran contributors, more powerful than any newcomers. And this is what happens with a number of online games also. <clears throat> Let's read from this passage that clarifies, that puts some evidence that claim the number of behavioral policies. This is one of the sections, the categories that I linked recently, last week and guidelines on Wikipedia is much higher than in most professional organizations, including academic organizations. There are 45,000 words just about proper conduct, the last time I checked, and there are over 1,000 other regulatory documents that keep changing, right? So you have to be part of the community. It's all about 
the number of hours you put into this, that gives you authority and the participants are not willing to let go of their power by simplifying this system of rules and policies by removing some of the policy documents. So if you apply this model, the author recognizes this is just an intellectual model, a working metaphor, then some of the puzzling <coughs> issues that you see in Wikipedia find a solution, find a response. So real life credentials are frowned on there. So you cannot just say, I'm a professor of X, so you should listen to my opinion, right? The same way that getting into a gamer's community, you cannot claim that whatever you do in real life should have an effect on your trust, your reputation, your credentials in the community, right? You have to play the game. You have to put in the, the hours. You have to go through the grinding. If Wikipedia is seen as an RPG role playing game, then you can also explain why people on the other side, the Avery Tower is the university, refuse to participate. To them, it's not serious enough. They see it as a social game. However, it's not like university is not a social game. University is a social game in a big way, even on the side of students, right? So it's just different values and different communities. And the author acknowledges that the university itself is like a theater, has its own rituals, peer review, tenure, promotion, student evaluations, etc., etc. But on your side, the letter of recommendation that you have, might have, or not have from a professor, that in the end, both in Wikipedia and the university, production of knowledge appears to be secondary or less than relevant compared to the social side of what you find there in the university and on Wikipedia. The next chapter is also interesting. That's why I picked uh, the, these two for my last formal lecture. It was written by a programmer, a programmer who's involved with Wikipedia itself, and his primary concern is organization of knowledge, and therefore to structure Wikipedia in such a way that Wikipedia can be made more comprehensive and highly structured across a variety of languages. It starts by mentioning what we've mentioned a number of times, that there are almost 300 language versions of Wikipedia. They're all independent in terms of content and in terms of point of view, right? There is no attempt from the top to standardize the content or the opinions inside Wikipedia. Of course, we know about neutrality, but we know that neutrality is an attempt, is an ongoing process, is not something static that can be applied that is either there or not there. It's a work in progress. Overall, in these 300 versions of Wikipedia, we find 50 million articles. And we know that, especially for other language versions of Wikipedia, sometimes the contributors in other languages will look at the English version of Wikipedia, which is the largest in terms of the number of articles, to transfer some of the content, to find their inspiration, to get up the ranks in an easier way. Sometimes there are passages that are simply translated. However, we cannot think of Wikipedia as something really homogeneous. There is a lot more diversity that you might assume. Professor. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Thanks. So let's look at some of the figures that are mentioned in this article which are pretty powerful, they paint an interesting picture. So at the time this article was 
written a few years ago, this must be two or three years ago, English had more than 5.8 million articles at this point, it's closer to 6.5 million articles. And interestingly, some of the other large uh, collections include areas and languages that are not so popular globally. For example, a language spoken in the Philippines has more than 5 million articles. Swedish, which is not the most global of European languages, has almost 4 million articles. However, when you examine how those language Wikipedias were developed, you find that a lot of bots simply transferred content from English into those languages. So it's not like they have a large base, a large active community. Keep in mind that there are, at this point, only a few hundred bots operating across the language version of Wikipedia, but those bots can be very active. A single bot can make hundreds of thousands of changes or even introduce tens of thousands of new articles. German has 2.3 million articles. And again, keep in mind that Sweden, the number of people in Germany is many times the number of people living in Sweden. And when you take the top nine language, you see that they, just those language versions, have more than half of all articles. And when you take bottom half of Wikipedia, you find that altogether they don't have put together more than 10% of the articles in the English Wikipedia. So some of those versions have only a few thousands of articles or a few tens of thousands of articles. Even in terms of how comprehensive the different versions are, the different articles, sorry, are, it's easy to see that Yes, you might find the same entry, you fi might find the same article in two language versions of Wikipedia, but the content of those articles with the same entry can be quite different, also in terms of quantity. The author made an effort to prove that by looking, for example, at the article on the German city of Frankfurt, which has almost 200,000 characters in the English version, a table of content with 87 sections and subsections, 95 images, tables, graphs, 92 references, right, to sources. And then you take a Wikipedia version in Hausa, which is a West African language spoken in Chad and parts of Nigeria, that has a community, a population of primary speakers of about 40 million and another 20 million who speak that language as a second language, there too you find an entry about the city of Frankfurt, but it simply says it's a city in a state, Germany is a federation, uh, has a certain number of residents, and they list the name of the mayor. No trace of all the subsection sections in the English version of Wikipedia. If you reverse this, you can also find that some of the uh, smaller global versions of Wikipedia will have very localized content that is not to be found in the English version. But it's not just in marginal areas that this is true, because even for the first nine languages, you find that the overlap is limited. And again, the author proves that with interesting numeric evidence, English Wikipedia having at the time of the article almost 6 million articles. The German Wikipedia at that time had 2.2 million articles. Only half of those articles were covered by both Wikipedias. So there was a large number of articles that were unique to either version. And if you take, instead of two, the top 10 Wikipedias by activity, by the number of edits during the last period, only 
uh, they have articles in common only about a hundred thousand different topics so quite a small overlap quite a limited overlap altogether we said 50 million articles but the number of topics because some of those articles are strongly connected are only 80 million and of those only 31% are found in the English version of Wikipedia. When you go and examine the overlap, you find differences not only in terms of content, but also in terms of how recently the article was edited and how up-to-date an article can be. Proof in point, evidence provided by the author includes this kind of research. So in 2018, San Francisco uh, changed their major, London breed became the mayor, and the author went to see how many of the language versions of Wikipedia had this kind of information, how many had the information updated after 2018. So this was done in 2018, and this justifies also the uh, number of articles in the English version being at fewer than 6 million. He went to see across versions of Wikipedia if the name of the mayor was included, what name would that be? So, 292 language editions in 2019, 165 of them had an article on San Francisco. Only 86, half of them, include the name of the mayor, but of those 86, 62 included a mayor from the past. So only 24 of them had the correct name for the most recent mayor. When you look at how much it was out of sync with elections in San Francisco, the information about the mayor, you find that not only some editions had the previous mayor, but some went back to the early 2000s. So the information had not been updated in 15 years. Keep in mind, this was done in 2019. Final point to show how different the level of engagement is across the language versions of Wikipedia, there are half of Wikipedias that have fewer than 10 active contributors. And keep in mind that you may have very few human contributors and uh, a small number of very active bots that are responsible for a lot of edits. From the point of view of a programmer, the author says, this is my solution. Now, we know that at some point in 2012, Wikipedia introduced Wikidata which is a repository of information that is structured in such a way across all articles of the same category that one can rely on that information to create a new entry, either uh, a human contributor or even a bot. And a lot of that is done. So in reference to San Francisco, Wikidata will have structured information such as San Francisco, Mayor London Brick, and from there, you can create an entry or update an entry if you go and check, if you use a bot, etc. And include all the chronology since July uh, 11, 2018, when Ronald Breed was elected, etc., etc. It reminds you how active the bots were, especially before Wikidata because with Wikidata, there is wider access to things that need updated even for the contributors and before bots can be scripted in a powerful way to navigate and decode the information more quickly than users. The solution proposed by this programmer is a model called Abstract Wikipedia. Essentially, the author calls for a standardized structure which is a globalized template for articles. He wants all the articles to be structured pretty much the same way, at least the main articles, the overlapping articles, 
And then he implies that uh, the localized topics, the topics that are locally of interest, will become the focus of the various Wikipedia communities across the globe. I'm not in agreement with this view. Uh, it, it clearly, the background of the author of the chapter, the proponent of this model, being a programmer, influenced this view. He sees this as something chaotic for which technology offers a solution. This technological solution is not necessarily the best for Wikipedia as a social community. Even the author has to acknowledge that sometimes information that is redundant, such as, he makes the following example, Marie Curie is the only woman to have had Nobel Prizes in two different fields. He says, well, this is already covered by the article. Why include this as the initial statement about Marie Curie in the entry uh, for this female scientist? Then he has to acknowledge that the human mind relies on these things, that humans look for that information. They want that information being brought to their attention, even though it's already dispersed and communicated in the article. So redundancy, not efficiency, is the basis for human communication. So a programmer wants to re reduce redundancy, increase efficiency. Humans don't work necessarily like that. Even the author has to acknowledge that, yes, you can globalize the template, but there is a huge diversity of roles played by the editors of Wikipedia. So how can you impose globalized models across a variety of contributing roles? And is the result conducive to diversity of content and use and as you can expect from the debate that has been going on during the last few years, the position preferred by the author is that, well, diversity of content is overvalued because after all, um, including a diversity of content can just increase the amount of political bias, meaning we as Wikipedians should not be cover all the, the whole spectrum of ideological positions because that might be dangerous, because that might include positions that are not politically and socially acceptable. So this is the final thesis by the author with an abstract Wikipedia, which is his own alternative model. The individual communities could explicitly choose which articles to create and to maintain their own, on their own, but Essentially, this is a position in favor of globalization and homogenization of Wikipedia and, uh, frankly, against basic diversity. That was the end of my presentation. And as promised, let me go to the short list of readings. This is a short page that I added to today's lesson plan, okay? Keep in mind what I said. There are five questions. You need to answer any four. There are essay questions. Uh, three of them are based on the textbooks. One of them is based on other topics that I introduced in class with some material and the lectures that I offered. One of them has to do with the intellectual and philosophical nature of the apps that we dealt with. So not technical questions, but questions about those uh, apps uh, in relationship to knowledge management. So this is the list. I added, whenever possible, the basic links, but it's up to you also to retrieve your notes and find anything else that was added in class. And one thing I'll do, of course, you have YouTube videos for all the classes. I know that a lot of people missed quite a few classes. Attendance was on average about 7% only. And therefore, what I'll do today or tomorrow, those videos are linked in the readings and lectures page, but are unlisted on YouTube, I'll 
temporarily make all of the videos for all of the lecture viewable, accessible through my YouTube channel so that you can take advantage of the search feature of YouTube if you're looking for a video to review, to review the lecture that I offered on a particular topic because that will be more agile than to have to go through and click um, through the lesson plans and click until you find the video the, or videos that you're looking for, okay? And then after the exam, I will make those videos unlisted once again. So the first point is about the question that would cover anything other than the readings or the apps. And I've listed two topics here connected to some notes that you find online and then go back also to the notes you took during my lectures that expanded on those topics. One of the topics was what is an epistemic engine, right? And to what extent a wiki is an epistemic engine. And we also talked at the beginning of the semester around two weeks, two and three, about Google, the principles of Google, the kind of knowledge you get on Google, okay? And that is some of the material that you can review inside a presentation, a page called Do You Google? As far as the first textbook, what is the history of knowledge? I've selected only one chapter. It is a substantial chapter, about 40 pages. And it is chapter three, Processes. I offered just a quick overview of this chapter, but the content of the chapter is pretty, is pretty clear. Uh, in this case, work does not overwhelm the reader with uh, details. The processes is about the four stages of a knowledge-based process that uh, uh, go under the acronym of CADA, C-A-D-A, -A, where C stands for collection of content of data, A stands for analysis, D for dissemination, A for application or activation. Of course, as far as what we did in class and the emphasis we placed on the digital apps, the three parts, the first three parts of this process are the most important. So focus on collection, analysis, and dissemination. Of these three, the two most important are collection and analysis, right? Just to give you some parameters. Let me go through this and then I'll ask you if you have any questions, and if we run out of time, of course, we can continue on Tuesday with questions. Second textbook, A Social History of the Media. My question will be based on content from one of these chapters, chapter four, chapter five. Chapter four is Technologies and Revolutions, and you have my notes, and of course, my notes were expanded in a variety of lectures, in several lectures, chapter five, new processes and patterns. And you find here the uh, pages you can click on and review. Still in reference to anything other than those textbooks, another topic that we spent a lot of time on was the points of contact between Wikipedia and the French Encyclopedia of the 18th century, especially in reference to the concept of neutrality. And you find my own notes. We had among the readings, the encyclopedia entry from L'Encyclopédie, the manifesto by Jimmy Wales, one of the founders of Wikipedia, what Wikipedia is not, and the five pillars, which is a quick review of everything that is essential to the operations of Wikipedia. In reference to the last textbook, my question will be based on one or more of these chapters because some of them are intertwined or take different sides on similar topics and themes. Chapters one, two, three, ten are those that you should review. And of course, you find inside this page of notes, this set of notes, Wikipedia 20, which I use including today for my lectures, you find my notes and go back to your own notes. 
In reference to the apps, as I said before, a question based on the apps would be based on the connections between knowledge management and the technical features of those apps. To what extent those apps are wiki apps? And again, the questions will not focus on the technical details, but in order to provide the best response to such a question, it's up to you to pick one or more apps and to introduce some specific examples, okay? Rather than uh, only discuss the generalities, only superficially discuss the features of those apps. So we have three or four minutes now for questions and then we can continue on Tuesday. So go ahead, the floor is yours for, for questions about the exam, about the shortlist, etc. Yes, please. Can you go over setting up the time slots for the presentations one more time? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let me show you. So there are several places. You can go to the calendar page, you can go to the announcement page, the syllabus as well, or you can just remember that the app is called Calendly, L-Y at the end, dot com slash Andrea Fedi. And once you click, you select the only event that is public at this point inside my app, which is oral presentations from for either of my classes. CLT 362 is my other class. So you click in here, and then you find, including today, 10 possible days, and any day you, se you select will offer you all the free time slot at that point between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And you select any you're interested in, then you press confirm, and then you enter first and last name, your Stony Brook email. You don't really have to provide any notes unless there is something, let's say you want to put there the link to a presentation that you'll be using during uh, the encounter with me, otherwise let it go. Or text messages, you don't have to put there your phone number, it, it's fine, okay? And then when you press schedule event, you will receive an email confirming the day and the time of your scheduled presentation. Keep that email, don't delete it yet, because in case you need to cancel and reschedule, that is the quickest way, because you'll have there a link to cancel and reschedule. Otherwise, if you accidentally delete it or cannot find it, you just go ahead, schedule another presentation, at a time that is more convenient for you, and then you email me telling me which one of those two that I see in my agenda is the right one and which one should be free for any other who wants to reserve it. 